I don't know if this is going to work, but we're going to try it out. I'm going to try to film this while uh, I'm running some errands. You know, when I was a younger man, back when, say, I was in high school, I'd gotten my driver's license near the end of my sophomore year of high school. But I didn't drive a whole lot because I didn't like to ask to borrow my mom's car or my dad's truck. I figured I needed a ride of my own, so that summer I got a job working at a grocery store. And I saved up my money. And near the end of the summer, before my junior year in high school, I'd found a 1985 Camaro. Mind you, this was back in 2003. It was a 1985 Camaro. It was straight drive, you know, manual. Um, my old man, he wanted, when he taught me and my younger brother to drive, say when I was 13 and 14, He'd take us up in the field and we'd drive his, uh, above our gardens back home and we would drive uh, his stick shift truck. He wanted us to learn that. Um, but yeah, that Camaro, it was a stick shift. It had T-tops. It was black. Unfortunately, it only had the 2.8 liter engine, uh, the V6, so it wasn't nothing, you know, to really be proud of. Oh, shit. This ain't gonna work. <laughs> Alright, I'm pulled over here, so hopefully the camcorder won't go uh, skittering off the dashboard. But anyways, you know, when I got that car, it opened up a whole new level of possibilities. When I entered school my junior year of high school, I had that ride. And you know, when you're 16, you're hormonal, you're high testosterone. And the only two things that were on my mind was playing sports and women. <laughs> now I've told you and I've shown you where I'm from up on the mountain in Northeast Tennessee. It's such a small village, it's an unincorporated community. We don't have a single stoplight there. It's that small. We don't have any chain restaurants. Uh, well, I take that back. There's a subway that's attached to one of the two gas stations. Um, to give you an idea of how small it is, we do have a high school there. There were, I was one of 42 people one of 42 students in my senior class. We were the smallest public school in the state of Tennessee that had a football team. And as far as women goes, it was always pretty slim pickings, to be honest. There were some pretty girls there in the village, but they weren't many women at all, to be honest. Uh, so, once I got this car, I was like, you know, me and some of my buddies, we was like, man, we're going to have to go elsewhere to find some women. We're going to have to come off this mountain. So what we would do is, when we weren't playing ball, we would go to other schools, like their ball games. Uh, if they had a dance afterwards, we'd crash it in order to meet women. It's good times, you know. And I remember telling one of my buddies, I was like, man, it's you go back about 1,100 years, it's like we're Vikings of sorts. We've left Scandinavia. We're going to stop over here in Ireland, and we're going to steal some Celtic women, and we're going to take them to Iceland. <laughs> I was interested in things like that back then. And you know, sometimes these guys at these other schools wouldn't take kindly to us, which is understandable, I suppose. You know, in college, this only seemed to accelerate. Um, 
we'd come off the mountain. I went to East Tennessee State. Every now and then I'd get invited to a party or something and I'd bring my friends with me. <laughs> this sometimes resulted in fights and feuds at these parties. <laughs> I remember one of my buddies, we had gotten to a huge fight one time because he was, uh, he was, uh, I guess caught making out with one of the guys at the house we were partying, his girlfriend. So that, that led to a huge fight, you know. But I mean, the, the pickings were slim, you know. <clears throat> I always knew that I would never end up with a woman or a wife from my village. I mean, you take a village that small, if you go back enough generations, you're going to be related to probably about 50, maybe 75% of the people there. I'm related to, I mean, it's just, it's just how it is, you know. A small, extremely rural area like that, you know. Never wanted to end up with a cousin, you know. And I'm aware. I remember hearing Bor Bormagni, one of my friends. I'll put a link to his channel in the box below. He talked about the Goldilocks uh, zone of reproduction, which, according to scientists, a man and a woman that's like, I think it's either, I think it's fourth cousin, maybe third cousin. That is like the prime, uh, say they produce a child, that child has the lowest percentage of having any birth defects. Their genetic material of the mother and father is far enough apart to where it's not like inbreeding, but it's close enough together that it's, uh, you know, it's not like miscegenating. You know, there's a lot of cases of miscegenation um, where the genetic material is just so far apart and it results in uh, flawed offspring, I guess you could say. But even then, that's a little too close for my comfort, to be honest. You know, later in college, I met my wife. She is not from Appalachia. She is from what I call the flatlands of North Central North Carolina. But anyways, why am I telling you some of these stories from the past? Well, the reason is that the last week or so, I've been thinking a lot about my elders. You should, if you're a young person, you should respect your elders. I mean, that's how I was raised. And I know um, in these circles, people, you know, cast off a lot of blame on to say the boomer generation, which there is a lot of blame to go around. This generation was born probably at the peak of prosperity. And if you look at the current state of America, it's fairly apparent that they have squandered it. And I have met some boomers that were remarkably selfish in my life. But this is not the rule, of course. I mean, my old man, he's a boomer. He was born in... 1959 and uh, he's the best man I know he is not your typical white boomer by any means if you look at the history of the cause in this country some of the most uh, some of the brightest figures in this movement's history were boomers I'm talking about people like Lewis Beam I'm talking about you know Robert J. Matthews, Frank Da Silva, those members of the Order, the Bruder Schweigen. I believe most of them were boomers. I'd have to go back and check. They may have been a silent generation uh, member or two. I need to go back and check, like I said. But I've been thinking a lot about my elders, and that's in my own family as well. You know, uh, I don't have any grandparents left. My grandparents have all been dead for a very long time now. Both of my parents are still alive. 
you know, if you're a young man, you need to talk to your elders. Um, you need, of course, respect them, you know. But you need to talk to them to gain information about the family, about your family's history. This is something that I've been doing lately. And while I have no grandparents left, I do have some great aunts and great uncles. And what I'm trying to do is I'm getting a notebook and I'm trying to just ask them things and write it down, you know. Because I want my child to have, my child or children to have this information when they get older. Because it's forgotten. Sadly, it can be lost. So that's why I want to record this, you know. One of the most important and dissident and perhaps rebellious things you can do is research your own family's history, your own genealogy, and your own heritage. So I want my child, my daughter, to know this, and if we have any more children, they will know it as well. Now lastly, I wanted to say something. Damn it, I don't know if I'll ever get this video finished. My memory card was full, so I talked to the camera for about five minutes with it not recording. But anyways, where was I? Um, I was talking about your elders recording your family history and some interesting stories because they're forgotten oftentimes. It's unfortunate, but it happens. Lastly, <clears throat> you know... I think it's extremely important for your elders to meet your children. Now, I mentioned a few minutes ago that I don't have any grandparents left. They've been dead for a very long time. They all led pretty, pretty harsh and rough lives. But I still have several great aunts and great uncles. And my daughter, she's a little over two months now two months old. I want her to meet her elders. Uh, she's gotten to meet her uh, great-grandmother, her mother's mother, mother's mother, you know. Um, she came down here and stayed with us for a while after the birth. Uh, she's got to meet all of her grandparents except one, uh, my father, which we're going to take take her back home to meet him here soon. But it's not just that. I want her to meet her mother's great-grandfather. He lives over in the Flatlands. He is in his mid-80s now. He uh, has worked most of his life as a cattle farmer. I want my granddaughter to meet him. I also have a great aunt who is 78 years old. Uh, she lives over near uh, Gastonia, North Carolina, not too far from Charlotte. Growing up, I was always really close to her, and I loved it when my when her family would come up to the holler and see our family. Uh, I was always close to her. I want her to meet her. And then there's also some other great aunts and uncles back home up on the mountain that I want her to meet, of course. Now, I think this is very important, extremely important, you know, not just for the elder, but also for the child. And what I mean by this is, it's important for the elder to meet the grandchild or great-grandchild or great-niece, whatever, you know. It's very important for them because... It shows the elder the fruits of their life. It's extremely important, I believe. And here's where I'm going to get into the metaphysical part. Say, I believe it's also important for the child to meet their elder ancestor. I mentioned a minute ago, my daughter is not even three months old yet. I want her to meet these elders. Even if, even if she might be too young to remember it. 
you know, myself, I can remember my first clear, concise memory is probably my third birthday. I can remember it quite well. But there's also like images and flashes that were prior to that that I can remember from, say, when I was like maybe two and a half years old, two and three quarters. But I can remember that. And even though my daughter still is, what, two and two and three quarters of years, uh, of years away from being three years old, I still want her to meet them. You know, the reason for this is, and I've always had this idea, I've always believed this, it's important for the child because even though consciously they may not be able to remember meeting this elder, and you see, I want these elders that I just named off, I want them to stick around as long as possible, of course. I hope their health stays good. And, uh, you know, I hope that my child uh, will consciously remember them. I hope they stay around that long. But even so, even if, you know, heaven forbid something was to happen to one of these elders that we were to travel and see and to let them hold our daughter. Even if, heaven forbid, something happens, their health goes awry, and they go on. Just the fact that they knew my granddaughter, and my, granddaughter, or my daughter met them, was held by them, I think there is some sort of metaphysical power in that. I think that it leaves a sort of imprint. Even though my child would be too young to consciously remember, nevertheless, I think there is some sort of metaphysical imprint that is left upon the child. You know, I have more of like a pagan sort of spirituality. I believe in reincarnation. But nevertheless, I think that it is important for us to do this sort of thing. And I know uh, some of the atheistic viewers may, you know, scoff at what I just uh, talked about here, but that's okay, you know, it's not for you. And you can believe whatever you want to believe, but these are my genuine and true beliefs. I think it's important. I think there's a sort of protection that is past. And I know I know that probably sounds woo-woo or whatever to some people, but I don't care. It's what I believe. Um, but anyways, uh, is there anything else? Yeah, you know, respect your elders. Go visit your elders, you know. Um, you need to make an effort. You need to try. And record things from them. Because this information, it could end up, you know, with their passing, could be lost forever, you know. Um, take care of doing that. Uh, I believe that's it. Um, thank you all for watching. Bye-bye.